In introducing the speaker for tonight, I thought I would start by reading a passage about Bowen Island uh, written more than 50 years ago by a longtime member of the Historical Society, Irene Howard. Some of you may remember Irene, she's written several books, um, um, uh, one of which I think her first perhaps was the one on Bowen Island, uh, who with the support and input from members of the Bowen Island community in 1973, published a book called Bowen Island 1872 to 1972. Uh, in it, Irene wrote as follows. This is a, a paragraph which I quite liked near the beginning of the book. Since the first settlers preempted land where uh, there 100 years ago, uh, or there 100 years ago, Bowen Island has been, for the people of Vancouver, an island of desire, a paradisical world presented by some uh, for some by, uh, by ne a never-ending series of overflowing picnic baskets uh, and fighting coho salmon on timeless summer cottage weekends. For others, uh, by a cabin in the bush, uh, uh, hewed from straight cedars and chinked with moss, and buckets of clams gathered from the tidal flats and wild blackberries from the woods where a timely deer may at some time come leaping through the Salal. And even now, when the unspoiled wilderness has gradually been appropriated by the people from the city as nigh as 1972, it still exists in the public mind, or rather in the public emotion, as the blue and green forest world they once knew, Bowen Island, in, the words, uh, in other words, is what mystiques are made of. The interesting story here, of course, in part, is this was a half century ago. Um, and many years have passed since uh, uh, Irene Howard's book appeared. And along the way, Bowen Island has changed, haven't we all? To tell us about the relationship between the old Bowen Island and the new, we have with us tonight Dr. Jack Little who has recently lived on Bowen, has been an active contributor to the Bowen Island community, including as a member of the, uh, uh, a board member of the Bowen Island Museum and Archives, and a member of the Bowen Island uh, Eco Alliance. Jack, whom I've known for, uh, I guess since we were both arrived at Simon Fraser in 1976, uh, seeking work, Jack brings to the task a long record of accomplishments as a professor of history at SFU. This record includes 12 books with a 13th on the way. Along in that period of time, Jack has written 13 books. I'm still working on my second. That tells us all we need to know. Uh, Jack's early work centered on the colonization and social history of the Eastern Townships in Quebec, but subsequently included the studies of Canadian travel narratives, tourism, 19th century landscapes, uh, and a fine biography uh, worth looking at for anybody interested in political history, including political history of British Columbia, fine biography of the Quebec senior and politician Sir Henri Gustave Jolie de la Pinière, who in 1900 became British Columbia's seventh lieutenant governor. Jack's gaze then turned westward to Bowen Island and to the anti-development movement on British Columbia's southwest coast, a book uh, about which uh, it, entitled At the Wilderness Edge, The Rise of the Anti-Development Movement on Canada's West Coast will be published in January. Tonight's talk is entitled in the Metropolitan Shadow, Bowen Island. Please welcome this evening's speaker, Dr. Jack Little. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, nice to see so many people out on such a wet evening. Um, I'm, this paper is actually a kind of a synthesis of three articles that I've written on Bowen Island uh, during the time uh, my wife and I lived there. One of them is yet to be published. It will be in the book that Bob mentioned that's coming out, uh, Anti-Development Protest. And uh, so this, that part will not have been published yet, but the other two are 
in this uh, paper tonight, one way or another. I discovered, actually, you know, it's interesting, uh, most people here are so familiar with Bowen Island because many of you are older, like I am. But the years I lived on Bowen, whenever I was in Vancouver and talked to, you know, merchants or barbers or whatever and said I was living on Bowen Island, it was like it was the other side of the world. They didn't know where it was. They didn't, they didn't really, couldn't understand how I could actually live there and go back and forth. So part of what I talk about in a way, I guess, is how Bowen Island has disappeared from uh, the uh, mental landscape of Vancouverites. So... Things then were very different in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and it, actually, right soon after Vancouver was born, uh, Bowen Island becomes a, a, a place of recreation for uh, Vancouverites. Um, and uh, it was because of the steam, local steamship companies who uh, were serving the coastline but had um, day trip or tourist uh, traffic to the, the local islands as a sideline. The first, the first steamship company involved was the Terminal Steamship Company in 1902. It launched a 105-foot steam screw vessel with a carrying capacity of 300 passengers that you see here. It featured two salons, one for ladies, one for gentlemen, seats upholstered with maroon plush, a dining room on the lower deck, and a promenade deck ab above. So the Britannia was a costly investment for 1902. That's uh, very early in Vancouver's history, but it proved to be a profitable one. The company founder, Captain John Cates, had acquired 130 hectares at Snug Cove and, and Deep Bay on the southeast coast of the island, where he planted 300 fruit trees, laid 1,500 meters of wooden uh, water pipe, brought in 12 portable houses, and erected a general store. Cates issued camping permits and promoted group picnics, such as the one organized for the city's printers on Dominion Day 1912 that you see here. Uh, with the developed section of Stanley Park becoming increasingly overcrowded and the rest of the park not that easily accessible to picnickers, the Vancouver World advised its readers in late July 1908, where can we go to get out of the heat? Go to Bowen Island where there is a cool sea breeze, fine shady trees, good water, good bathing and one of the finest cafes on the coast. Uh, the summer excursions became so popular that in 1909 the company purchased a large paddle wheel steamer that had served on the Fraser River, followed by another ship in 1912 and yet another one in 1914, each more than twice the size of the Britannia. Cates acquired more land and built a hotel so that in his company brochure of 1917 he was able to advertise what he called a well-planned um, park with several picnic grounds featuring covered tables. You'll see uh, the, the cabins here, actually, the cottages they built that I'll talk later, and these are the picnic grounds, uh, those cleared spaces. Um, refreshment parlors, uh, hotel dining room, um, dance pavilion, all which was a sharp contrast, of course, to naturalistic Stanley Park. And even though the artificial amusement parks had to a large extent uh, superseded picnic groves and other natural attractions in Washington State by World War I, this would be far from the case of Van for Vancouver during the next three or four decades. Indeed, Happy Land and the East End ha Hastings Park struggled financially until being replaced by Playland in 1957. Um, meanwhile, the First World War failed to stop recreation expansion on Bowen Island, for more cottages were built, and company assets totaled nearly $250,000 by the end of 1919. The following year, however, Cates sold his business to the Liverpool-based Union Steamship Company, which had been serving the coast since 1889. The Union Steamship Company proceeded to build the largest dance pavilion in the province, in fact, I think the largest north of uh, California, with a spring hardwood floor and space for 800 couples, and it constructed a, a hundred attractively designed uh, cottage bungalows. People live still are living in these today. Uh, and uh, as well as small camp cottages. Um, and these I'll talk about later because they've become controversial recently. These were to replace what the company's historian, Gerald Rushton, referred to as Captain Cates's old shacks and ramshackle tent camps. Both categories of these structures were originally available on a seasonal basis only, from May 1st to September 30th, which explains why the Friday evening arrivals from Vancouver were known as the daddy boats. The daddies came over only for the weekends. Um, within the next couple of years, a saltwater swimming pool was in installed. New trails were extended from the cottage areas to Bridal Falls and Killarney Lake, 
which was advertised as having excellent fishing, and the Terminal Hotel was enlarged and renovated as Mount Strand Lodge, later renamed the Bowen Island Inn. For $5 a night, a company brochure promised, hotel guests would receive a front room with balcony overlooking expansive lawns, flower beds, and a monkey tree, which you can see here when it was young, as well as a view of Deep Bay, House Sound, and the Coast Mountains. With an operating uh, profit of nearly a million dollars in three years, the Union Steamship Company with, was finding that the excursion boom was developing almost too rapidly to keep up with. In 1925, it purchased two covered con converted minesweepers, each with a capacity for 900 passengers, but it was the Lady Alexandria ordered from a Scottish shipyard that became the flagship of the new excursion fleet. Car uh, capable of carrying 1,400 people, the Lady Alex, as she was popularly known, was the biggest excursion character carrier north of San Francisco. Aside from the several trips a day to Bowen during the weekends, the Lady Alex was used on two evenings a week for moonlight cruises to Snug Cove, where the ship's orchestra disembarked to continue playing at the Dance Pavilion, which was uh, a nursery and a hothouse to the sweet buds of summer romance, according to one nostalgic account. <laughs> That may be an Irene Howard, I don't remember. Fares uh, were clearly affordable at 90 cents for a day trip, a return ticket. Uh, and uh, admission to the pavilion for dancing was only a dollar, which represented less than an hour's pay for the average semi-skilled worker at that time. Um, but it was the picnic grounds at what was known at Deep Bay Sandy Beach. So Deep Bay is right beside Snug Cove. It's this point of, uh, this is the part that became uh, the swimming beach. And uh, the sand that these people are standing on was ballast from Scotland that came in the Lady Alexandra. Today it's too polluted to go into, by the way, a few people there, but. So this is what attracted most of the passengers. Despite the economic downturn in the 1930s, Bowen Park's six picnic grounds were fully booked on summer weekends. The Union Steamship Line carried 57,000 passengers to the island in 1931 when the population of the Vancouver was recorded at only 246,000. So that's about one in four Vancouverites would go to Bowen Island, or the equivalent of one in four uh, during the summer. Uh, that's just on the Union Steamship. Of course, other people went on private boats and so on as well. The province's tourist industry paled in comparison to the excursion trade. Uh, and the excursion trade wasn't exclusively the Union Steamship Company. The CPR had their Princess Cruises, and they had their own resort on Newcastle Island, which is now a park. In 1934, there were only 4,000 automobiles entering from California into the province, and that was the principal source of tourists. So um, it paled in comparison to the number of people going to uh, the cruises on the, and mostly local people um, up the coast. The Union Steamship Company's calendar of events for Snug Cove, just to give you a taste of how, uh, how well organized it was, August 1934 included a swimming gala on the 4th, field sports on the 11th, a highland gathering with dancing and piping contests on the 18th, a canoe race from English Bay on the 19th, a lawn bowling tournament as well as a masquerade dance on the 25th and 26th. Other events included speedboat trials, band concerts, and a weekly van vaudeville show at the band shell. Company picnics, which is what I was particularly interested in, I did an exhibit a year or so ago with all the panorama photos that we had uh, in the museum and archives. This is just a very small one compared to these huge ones that we have. Um, these were uh, accounted for a substantial proportion of the summer traffic to Bowen. And they were a relatively inexpensive but highly visible feature for what is known as welfare capital or welfare industrial capitalism, which was very popular at the time. This was a way of preventing unionization, companies acting in a paternalistic way. It was probably no accident, therefore, that most of the companies involved were in the non-industrial sector and therefore not unionized. Thus, there were picnics for the employees of Safeway Stores, Kelly Douglas, The Bay, Woodward's, Henry Burke's, The Grain Trade, and The White Lunch, uh, many of whom were women. And these are women on the way there who work for Spencer's. Uh, some sense of the scale of these excursions is revealed in the Vancouver Sun's description of the May 25, 1939 annual moonlight cruise, carnival, and dance organized by employees of Spencer's department store. Spencer's actually published a little newsletter, uh, which we have copies of for each of these annual cruises. And they referred to their employees as the big family. Um, and these were Spencer's girls, by the way. 
Uh, the Spencer's Remnants Marching Band, uh, made of vet, you know, consisting of veterans from the war, uh, and he hired veterans as much as possible, piped a thousand people aboard the Lady Alex, which according to the sun was jam-packed, but no one noticed the lack of room. A sing-song was started on the top deck and continued almost the entire trip. A gay dance crowd found the orchestra and the floor in the ship's dining room, and the overflow spread throughout the vessel. But group picnics were also organized by voluntary associations. They weren't just company picnics, such as the Happier Old Age Club. Somebody mentioned that to me a little while ago. Uh, the Gaelic Society, Sons of Norway, United Scottish Society, Seaforth Highlanders, Congregation of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and the Loyal Order of the Moose for the Children of the True Blue Orphanage. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Even a few unions, such as the Plumbers and Steamfitters Union and the Carpenters Union, held annual picnics. But the one organized by the Vancouver and District Waterfront Workers, uh, that was the last big one every year, uh, was a clear example of corporate welfareism because it was a company union. The Shipping Federation of British Columbia, which controlled the union until 1935, the year after this photo was taken, uh, gave its members the day off, arranged for special transportation rates, and provided free refreshment tickets for the crowd of 3,000 people. Bowen Island became even more popular after the opening of the Lionsgate Bridge in November 1938, uh, made the lower mainland's North Shore more accessible from Vancouver. In mid-July 1939, for example, the 33rd annual picnic of Vancouver's grocers, bakers, and meat dealers required three boats to ferry the participants to the island. The war did not bring a decline in the steamer traffic, as you might have expected, but rather the reverse, as the city population was swollen by shipbuilding and other defense industries, and gasoline restrictions forced people to holiday close to home. 1942 brought a record-breaking 81,000 visitors to Bowen Island on Union Steamship Company vessels. And the all-time high of 101,000 was reached in 1946, when the population of Vancouver was only 365,000, so almost one in three. This is the period when, according to the company historian, the behavior of what he called wartime rowdies caused the Saturday night cruises to become known as the booze cruises. <laughs> and the wild bacchanalias did not end with the war. A press headline from 1947 announced that five youths had been charged after a drinking party on Bowen Island. And on May 24th weekend of 1948, the provincial, provincial police seized $250 worth of liquor and made 30 arrests in what the Vancouver Sun called a drive to rid Bowen Island of unlawful drinking and rowdyism. Unreported, but more troubling than this negative press attention, was the rather precipitous decline in visitors after wartime restrictions on gasoline were removed and motorists took to the highways. Fewer and fewer people were enticed by the promise that, quote, there's no traffic problem when you and your friends take a boat to Bowen. Still, large-scale company picnics, or group picnics, remain popular. On July 10th, 1952, for example, the Vancouver Sun reported that more than 1,000 merrymakers, including members of Branch 44 Canadian Legion, Pacific Coast Packers, BC Fur and Cedar Lumber Company, and the United Jewish People's Order clearly uh, were there. Clearly then, the picnic grounds of Bowen Island continued to be important sites for workers' recreation as well as for social mixing between diverse cultural groups. And in my one, the first article I wrote, I make that argument that Vancouver's a new city, people come from all over the place, don't know each other. This was the place where they uh, sort of form social uh, bonds within in their, even if it's only within their own groups. Uh, but 1953 would be the end of an era as far as the big company picnic on Bowen was concerned, presumably because catering to a few summer weekends didn't generate enough profits to warrant the replacement of the aging fleet. There had always been a certain amount of class segregation on Bowen, with the middle class gravitating towards the hotel and the upscale cottages, but the trend towards becoming a more exclusive middle-class resort was accelerated after 1955, when control of the Union Steamship Company changed as three Vancouver businessmen purchased the majority of the shares. The company then announced that it would invest a million dollars to create what they called one of North America's most luxurious resorts by renovating some of the cottages, re-establishing the riding stables and bridle paths, laying out a golf course and docking facilities for private boats installing a swimming pool in front of the hotel, which you see here, <coughs> converting the dance pavilion into a concert hall, and transporting guests from the mainland in a private yacht. The Snug Cove picnic ground would be accessible to everyone, but outdoor tables and handles of water taps near the cottages were removed, public toilets were locked, and what was known as Evergreen Park Resort was restricted to the use of hotel guests. Local residents were not pleased. 
uh, but it was probably no consoli consolation that the resort was a financial failure and that the golf course was never laid out. The hotel closed permanently in 1957, the uh, same year this photo was taken, and the car ferry service to the island began that year with inaugural speakers expressing the hope that Bowen would soon become a suburb of Vancouver. Although the cottages continued to be fully booked, they were offered for sale at a dollar each to anyone who would move one away in order to follow, allow the company to sell its 120 lots for development. So most of them were just allowed to decay or they were burned down. Union Steamship Company estate agent Graham Budge predicted in 1967 that within 10 or 15 years, Bowen, the island might well replace West Vancouver as Vancouver's bedroom. Budge's prediction was widely off the mark, failing to take into account as it did not only the cost an inconvenience of the ferry ride for commuters, but the island's mountainous and rocky topography. As late as 1971, there were only 351 year-round inhabitants on the island. <clears throat> that was nearly 50 square miles, square kilometers in size. Um, development pressures on the Gulf Islands were increasing by the late 1960s, however, forcing the provincial government to respond to calls for regulation and control. In 1969, when there were 117 applications to purchase Crown land on Bowen alone, the Social Credit Administration, evidently bowing to pressure from well-heeled supporters who owned seasonal properties on the Gulf Islands, and very well-heeled uh, supporters owned land at the, or caught properties at the north and south ends of the island, imposed a sales freeze on all those islands, plus a freeze on the subdivision of privately owned lots that were under 10 acres in size, pending land and water surveys. The Bowenian, which was the mouthpiece of the Bowen Island Improvement Association, I'll call it BIIA sometimes, expressed its gratitude, claiming that if nothing had been done, the island would become a bald prairie, for the actual attraction in the eyes of the so-called developers was the island's prime timber, it claimed. Imagine coming in on the ferry and seeing those beautiful knolls ahead all cut and covered in slash, the editor wrote. Not only would the island's beauty have gone, but your property and mine would have be worth half today's value. The Crown Land Freeze, which would become permanent for large tracts in early 1971, affected two Bowen interests in particular. For the, <coughs> the Union Steamship Company had applied to add 1,300 Crown Acres to the 1,200 it already owned, and Maui Holding Limited applied for 540 acres. Both companies had more ambitious plans than simply cutting timber, however, but they would soon be, uh, and they were soon consolidated under the Union Steamship name. The idea behind the government imposed sale freeze was that it would remain in force until zoning bylaws were passed, as I already mentioned. In Bowen's case, the body in charge was the GVRD, Greater Vancouver Regional District, which included one representative from the island and which contra contracted local planning to a private firm in consultation with each member community's appointed six-member advisory planning commission, sometimes, well, usually known as the APC, so the island had six-member informal government in a way. At first, progress was rapid, for in, in January 1972, GVRD representatives presented zoning bylaws for discussion at a heavily attended and lively public meeting on Bowen. Attendees were informed that once the revised plan had been endorsed by the GVRD, there would be further meetings to seek public approval, followed by a local referendum. The most contentious issue was the minimum acreage that could be subdivided, with the chair of this GVRD observing that there were two entirely different perspectives. On the one hand, the individual property owner, and on the other, the developer, both approaching the problem from their own selfish point of view. The zoning bylaw proposed by the GVRD uh, in June 72 fixed 6,000 square feet as the minimum lot size in areas with sewage facilities. But the second public hearing in November, this was increased to 7,500 square feet due to local pressure, uh, which would allow for five houses per acre. This didn't satisfy the BIIA, however, which circulated a petition asking that the minimum be increased to 12,000 square feet. The reasons given in the Boenian were essentially aesthetic, uh, for its readers were asked if they wished to see the island's green slopes above uh, Snug Cove crisscrossed with blacktop roads and checkered with the houses of overpopulated growth. As for Stan James, the controversial West Vancouver developer who had recently purchased the Union Steamship Company lands, he complained that a decrease in density from 6,000 square feet per building lot, uh, which it was originally proposed, would jeopardize his plan for what he called clusters of residential units set into the existing forest cover, the majority of which will surround the proposed golf course. And the golf course runs through history of Bowen Island as something that's always desired by certain people. 
Actually, I don't have time to talk about it today, but in my longer paper, that's one of the themes. There remained the 10-acre freeze issue for the Gulf Islands. Bowen's representative on the GVRD, Graham Budge, who had been used to work for the uh, Union Steamship Company, he ne was a, now a local realtor. He convinced the GVRD to pass a bylaw exempting Bowen from the freeze. In response, the BIA printed Save Bowen Island bumper stickers and circulated a questionnaire soliciting opinions on zoning and the need for a comprehensive study on the island's resources before the approval of any further property developments. The tide was in the BIA's favor because the recently elected NDP government refused to approve the bylaw of uh, this uh, exemption that Bowen had pending the report of the 12 member legislative committee it had appointed to study the land situation in all the Gulf Islands. Shortly before the committee chaired by Alfred Nunweiler, who was uh, NDP MLA for Fort George, shortly before it arrived on Bowen in the summer of 1973, the outspokenly pro-free enterprise Don Cromie published a letter in the Vancouver Sun, which he had until recently owned warning that, quote, land values and public search for a share in our environmentally del delightful vacation and commuter and retirement lands are at stake. Despite his own elevated social status, Cromie proceeded to associate those who opposed large-scale development on Bowen with the members of his own Vancouver elite, who kept their waterfront properties, he said, as a private reserve, with no public beach access or parking, and who opposed any change to their spooky, if effective, water system and forbidding roads. Meanwhile, due to the 10-acre freeze, Cromie concluded, our coast and islands sleep nearly empty in the sun, progressively depleted of their, un of their uh, um, unemployed young people, while Washington State developers cultivate our market with glee and fill the project after project with BC customers. Cromie had in mind his own Tunstall Bay development, which is where I happen to live until that recently, on the west side of Bowen Island, for he had managed to survey only 131 of 450 planned lots before the freeze was imposed. While he claimed that the BIA's proposed total resource study was unnecessary because, he said, all of the relevant information already exists, he clearly feared that its findings would jeopardize the future development of his property. Cromie claimed that an engineering firm had reported that Killarney Lake and Grafton Lake watersheds provided enough water for, for 25,000 to 30,000 people, which is clearly ridiculous, um, given the hot, dry summers we're all familiar with. The Nunweiler Committee's public consultation on Bowen took place in July 1973, when, according to The Sun, more than 200 people jammed the meeting and another 100 waited outside. So that's about everybody who lived on the island, but of course there were non-residents as well. As a result, the committee recommended that the local community provide input into the final plan and bylaws that the GVRD would be drafting for the island. In response, the BIIA drafted a plan that recommended a slow growth policy to ensure that the island remained what it called a restful refuge for residents as well as for tourists. The proposal's highlights included a permanent freeze on the further lease of, uh, or sale of Crown land, Conservation of agricultural land, this precedes the ALR, remember. Creation of parks, prohibition of roadside advertising, and a ban on logging. The, the plan also reiterated the request for thorough studies of water, sewage, and transportation systems, and recommended zoning categories to perpetuate what it called the rural character of the island, plus government acquisition of some privately owned scenic sites. Finally, the far-reaching plan stated that Separations between subdivisions are to be encouraged to prevent them from growing together and creating large patterns of continuing, uh, continuous housing developments. That no subdivision lots will be allowed to border on or cross lakes and creeks. And that commercial and light industry development should be strictly limited to serving the needs of island residents and visitors only. Such developments would also be subject to rigid design controls to ensure that they blend with surrounding features. In short, the BIA members were not simply romantics recoiling against modernity, that's part of it, but they also believed in, un in enlightened management over and above the pursuit of private property. By that I mean that the call for all these, uh, survey these uh, scientific surveys of resources. The BIA did not represent the view of everyone on the island, however, for a newly formed group known as the Bowen Ratepayers Association presented its own community plan to the GVRD. As the voice of the island's developers and large property holders, the Ratepayers Association opposed uh, <coughs> zoning regulations entirely. And in the words of a Vancouver newspaper article, favored a system of land use contracts 
to be worked out between the island's governing body and individual members. So uh, in other words, each, each person who wanted to develop something would just go individually to the governing body instead of having a plan. The association's plan included uh, ecological reserves, at least one major park, neighborhood and village parks, uh, common land accompanying strata development, all very green, um, but also public beaches. But they also wanted marinas, hotels, resorts, golf courses, more summer cottages, campgrounds, tree farms, and light industry. Less realistically, they also proposed that six sites be reserved for village shopping centers. I don't know where they would have put them. And that a road be constructed around the island's mountainous perimeter. And believe me, it is mountainous at the north end. In fact, the BRA claimed that it could see no reason why the island could not accommodate 50,000 people, said to be two housing units per acre of private land. Uh, by the end of the century, uh, there were only 3,400 residents as late as 2011, by the way. Finally, the ratepayers' mouthpiece, the Bowen Breeze, warned that one way or another, the socialists are going to take your property away from you. It may not happen this year or next, but already the machinery is in operation. If they don't get it under regional zoning or building restrictions, they'll get it under land reserves, agricultural reserves, waterfront reserves, park reserves, you name it. They're chip, chip, chipping away at property rights that have carried since Magna Carta. The short-lived newspaper was sh shouting in the wind, however, for the BIIA, the pro-greens, I guess, boasted 700 members, many of them obviously seasonal residents since there were not that many people on the island, but the BRA only had 120. The general attitude was clearly much the same in the other Gulf Islands. For the new Nunweiler report, which was tabled in September 73, uh, was very much in the spirit of those recommendations from the BIA, which I just uh, described in a little bit of detail. In fact, it, it concluded that the islands are too important to the people of Canada to be left open to exploitation by real estate developers and speculators. Clearly fearing that those interests would have too much influence within the GVRD, dominated as it was by suburban mayors and councillors, uh, the commission also recommended the creation of, the islands, of an islands trust to be responsible for and to coordinate the future of the islands. The NDP government responded positively by creating the Islands Trust, capital I, capital T, with two elected members from each of the Gulf Islands, as well as three government appointees. With the assistance of the Trust, as well as GVRD planners, Bowen's elected advisory planning commission uh, produced an official community plan, OCP, in June 75. Not surprisingly, it closely recommended, uh, reflected the recommendations the BIIA had presented to the Nunweiler Commission, so I won't repeat them a year and a half earlier. Bowen might be able to support 5,000 permanent and seasonal residents, the community plan concluded, but a population above that will force the island community into urban economies of scale and service, and Bowen Island will become uh, a suburb of Vancouver with the high tax costs and social problems experienced by suburban communities. As with other Gulf Islanders then, members of the BIIA and the Bowen Island APC Advisory Planning Commission prom promoted what they considered to be the island's distinctive lifestyle, one in keeping with the Arcadian tradition that came to be had come to be defined as the balance between nature and culture. But the developers were not prepared to give up without a fight. Despite the com his complaint that the proposed OCP has virtually expropriated his resort, Stan James printed a glossy brochure advertising essentially what an American historian is defined as a wilderburb, I love that name, which was namely a traditional sized subdivision uh, located far beyond the city's edge. And he describes a number of them in the United States. James's plan featured single story houses located inland, this is a quote, located inland in clusters adjacent to lakes and planned golf courses, as well as being screened by massive green belts and completely obscured from the uh, existing government blacktop roads. The brochure also claimed that sufficient water, sewage, and ecological studies for the proposed development were completed four years ago, and that the zoning bylaw he had complained so bitterly about, uh, said it was expropriating him essentially, he now said it would allow for 2,000 units on 300 acres. In addition, James promised uh, planned community and recreation facilities and amenities that included golf courses, a winter club. People talk about how he was planning to have a ski resort on Bowen, so uh, this is the only reference I've seen that might uh, mean that. that. In this brochure, he talks about a winter club. Riding, tennis, and squash courts, marinas, plus a medical dental center. In short, at a selling price of from $20,000 here at Weep for a one-bedroom bungalow to $30,000 for a three-bedroom one, the USC was offering what it referred to as 
quality medium priced housing in a country club setting. There were serious flaws to James's grand plan as the GVRD consultant to, to the Bowen's APC pointed out. These included the problem of water supply during the dry summers, the prohibitive cost of running sewers through rocky terrain, and the expense of commuting by ferry to work off island. James had taken steps to address the latter problem by contracting with a Pittsburgh company to build three 50-foot quiet hover ferries. I've never heard a quiet hover ferry, but he said he, said he bought. Each costing $500,000, each capable of carrying 62 boat passengers from Bowen to downtown Vancouver in 15 minutes. The ferries were also to serve his seashell development on the nearby Sunshine Coast. Union Steamship Company had a development uh, on the Sunshine Coast as well, which he acquired when he bought their, la their land. Uh, and, but the fact was that James had yet to obtain approval from local regulatory agencies. So he went out and bought these things without even getting approval to operate them. Um, and a March news release drafted by the BIIA noted that Hong Kong, Sydney, Southampton, and other ports where similar vessels were reportedly used are free of logs and the kind of flotsam that abounds in our waters. The news release asked readers to picture themselves hitting a telegraph pole at 50 miles an hour with your car and then imagine the damage that could be done to a rudder and a propeller, not to mention the hole in the hull. Even without such mishaps, the article added, the three vessels would be able to deliver only a small percentage of the approximately 1,500 commuters to downtown Vancouver in a timely manner. They only had 600 people, did he say, uh, or 60-some people per, per boat would not, not do a, hardly a dent in the number of commuters that would come if his, if his uh, project went through. Um, and of course, there was the costly uh, $27,000 insurance, fuel and maintenance per month, and so on. The BIIA also splashed cold water in, uh, on James's promised plan that he would sell those three bedroom houses for $30,000, noting that building costs for such a house on Bowen would be at least $34,000, added to the minimum land cost of $8,500. Perhaps not surprisingly, the seashell development that he had gone ahead with was, uh, and was basing his figures on was halted by the province's superintendent of insurance a month later, following complaints about contraventions of the Real Estate Act. Unpaid suppliers and subcontractors had slapped liens on some of the properties, with the result that, according to the Vancouver Sun, about 40 families attracted by the prospect of low-cost housing have paid dearly in time and anxiety for their involvement with the Seaside Village project. In the meantime, James fought the BIIA and the APC by threatening to block residents' access to the company's facilities and parks, as well as to double the water rates and deny further wa water hookups for the foreseeable future. He also joined forces with the other large landholders on the island to sabotage the draft OCP at a public meeting held to approve it in March 76. Burnaby Mayor Tom Constable, who chaired the island's overflow meeting of 260, reported that of the 16 briefs presented, not one supported the APC's restrictive proposals. Constable added that there would obviously have to be some changes in the plan before it could be approved by the GVRD and that another public meeting would likely be necessary. According to a Vancouver Sun reporter who had attended the meeting, however, the great majority in the attendance actually favored the draft OCP, although only two of them spoke out. Perhaps cowed by the campaign James and others had orchestrated, the newspaper said, the rest just watched spectators to the end, though they may have been witnessing a fatal blow to a way of life most have cherished and would want to pass on to their children. Don Cromey claimed in turn that Quote, the repressives hope to delay recognition of the turn of public opinion on Bowen and the turmoil, sorry, I said the, the repressives, uh, and the turmoil arising from understanding of the plan's devious blockages buried in its morass of amateur experience. Don uh, Cromie was a, very good with words as a journalist. In response, the BIIA produced a circular that challenged the assertion that the community plan meant no growth by pointing out that there were more than 600 lots already subdivided and eligible for development, and that they were being built on at an average of 50 a year. Not only did those who oppose the draft OCP seek the destruction of island life through urbanization, the circular concluded, but Bowen Island has an obligation to the rest of the province as a recreational area and facility. In the end, more than 40 Bowen residents and property owners wrote letters to the GVRD supporting the draft OCP, and 287 permanent residents signed a petition in its favor. 
So the GVRD Planning Committee did vote in favor of the OCP, and at the public meeting that followed in May 76, almost all the presentations were in favor. The Islands Trust then added its stamp of approval, as did the full GVRD board, thereby almost bringing to a conclusion a process that had involved 62 seminars, two public meetings chaired by the GVRD, and the receipt of over 200 written submissions. Almost, but not quite, because now the Socreds are in power, and the Minister of Municipal Affairs announced six months later, in December 76, that he would return the plan to the GVRD for further refinement. This gave the developers a final kick at the can, with Ted Rogers of the influential Rogers Sugar family, they own most of the southern part of the island, uh, following Cromie's uh, example by point, uh, pointing in a public letter, at, again, at members of his own social elite, namely what he referred to as the tiny clique of wealthy and willful small lot owners and their planner supporters. If their plans were implemented, Rogers claimed rather illogically, the recreation role of Bowen that goes back over 50 years will finally be completely destroyed. So development would be good for recreation, is what he's saying. At last, after still further discussion by the GVRD, Islands Trust, to the APC, as well as delegations, etc., etc., the amended OCP did become legislation in June 1977, and the 10-acre freeze was lifted soon afterwards, after being in place for eight years. Okay, we're moving into stage three. This is a shorter one. Stan James persisted with his development project, however, despite, despite facing bankruptcy with sizable mortgages and loans bearing 25 to 30 percent interest. In February 1977, he stubbornly resumed clearing land for a 200-acre, nine-hole golf course near Killarney Lake until progress was halted by a, pic a picket line. Uh, I wish I had better photos of the picket lines, but this is what we have. If, if I could show the film, there's actually a film of it. A violent confrontation ensued when a bulldozer drove through the 40 demonstrators. Three people clung to the blade while the operator, despite being pelted with mud, sticks, and stones by a pursuing crowd, drove about 150 meters. It's hard to believe, 100, that's a football field and a half with people throwing stones at him, at him uh, before coming to a halt. The wife of one of the riders then jumped into the cab, grabbed the driver, who roughly brushed her aside, only to be punched by her burly husband. <laughs> Coincidentally, it appears that same day, the provincial government issued a, a cease and desist order against further clearing, pending an official uh, investigation. But the saga was effectively over, for James's creditors soon foreclosed on him, and his dream of a golf course and a 2,000 lot subdivision went no further. Given the physical challenges uh, presented by, to the island, uh, Give, presented by the island, James's ambitious project was probably too large to succeed, even without the restrictions imposed by the official community plan. But local protesters had ensured that the environmental damage it caused was kept to a strict minimum, just clear-cutting along the side of the road for a hundred yards or so. There remained the question of what to do with the former Union Steamship Company property. A small subdivision had been created to the immediate north of Snug Cove in the Deep Bay area but most of the land remained empty. In 1978, a year after the famous bulldozer incident, a group of 100 or so local residents formed the Bowen Island Park and Store Use Society with the immediate goal of preventing the demolition of the abandoned Union Steamship Company store, which you see here, um, and an attractive 1920s arts and crafts building with the Tudor Revival elements, the building known locally as the Old General Store was Snug Cove's most important historic building. Um, this is uh, the, the, the opening of it once it was uh, saved by all these people. The other goal, as the name of the group suggests, was to uh, attain official park status for the company's undeveloped land. The case made to the Provincial Minister of Lands, Parks and Housing was that a sizable block of the union's f former Union Steamship land was available for less than half its assessed value. This meant that the obstacle to assembling land that complicated park creation elsewhere in the Lower Mainland did not exist or apply to Bowen. The society also noted that the park would include foreshore at Snug Cove, a sandy swimming beach at neighboring Deep Bay, a lagoon with opportunities for canoeing and fishing, a trail passing picturesque Bridal Falls to Killarney Lake, which uh, lay within the Union Steamship Block and contained a cutthroat trout fishery, farm fields south of Killarney Lake that could be leased to the public for allotment gardens or community pasture, open areas in the village of Snug Cove that had formerly been used as the Union Steamship uh, picnic grounds, and nearby Dorman Point with its elevated view of Howe Sound, 
and finally the former company store which could serve as an information center as well as park headquarters. They still use the upstairs uh, the park uh, does for their local headquarters. Furthermore, the park trail trails could provide access to Crown-owned Mount Gardner, which offered spectacular views of Collingwood Channel, Howe Sound, and Vancouver. If you haven't hiked up there, you should do it. It's been great. I've done it hundreds of times. Finally, the scenic ride from Horseshoe Bay on the mainland to Snug Cove would also attract park visitors. In short, the site proposed for the park offered variety as well as accessibility. Campaigning with the motto, Bowen Island Park, 1990, the Park and Store Use Society claimed that within little more than a decade, the park would be paying it for itself as an outstanding tourist attraction for all out-of-province visitors. The Society's restoration and lobbying efforts, financed in large part by a flea market in the old store, led in 1981 to the Bowen Island Park Review, initiated by the Ministry of Land, Parks and Housing, and with the cooperation of Islands Trust. Noting that sewage and water supply limitation of the island, uh, noting those, the review stated that the potential for housing development was extremely limited, but that its diversity of landscapes and shorelines meant that many potential park sites existed there. Furthermore, the review claimed that the need for parks and outdoor recreation was rapidly climbing with the growth of Vancouver's population and the increase of leisure time. Finally, with the remaining structures of the Union Steamship era clearly in mind, the report stated that historical significance would be a major attraction for the park site. Although the relatively small Bowen Track conformed more closely to uh, that of a regional park than a provincial park, which was supposed to encompass vast areas of land in order to attain a wilderness experience for park users, that's their words, the Park Review Report recommended that most of the, island, the land known as Union Steamship Properties converted to a Class A provincial park. So they wanted it to be a provincial park, even though it was too small for that, uh, theoretically. Um, because it would have the resort, the province would have the resources and expertise to manage this park to the high standards expected by residents and visitors alike. The report also observed that by including in the park the two new crown, adjacent crown-owned blocks, uh, the lower mainland, and that included uh, Mount Gardner, uh, would be brought closer to the provincial park standard of 21.5 hectares per thousand people. Uh, <coughs> so they were, the Vancouver area lower mainland was very underrepresented in terms of provincial parks at that time. The members of the Bowen Island Park and Store Use Society unanimously improved the study's recommendations, but no steps were taken until two years later in 1983, by which time the re-elected social credit government was cutting back on public services, including provincial parks. You probably remember. Its focus at that time was expenditures on mega projects, such as Vancouver's giant BC Place Stadium, the SkyTrain, and Coquihalla Highway. Despite the Park Review Committee's strong recommendation, therefore, it was not the province, but a somewhat reluctant GVRD with its limited operating budget that paid $1.7 million for the 600 acres to be named Crippen Park in honor of the current owner. The, G the GVRD chair predicted that islanders would be tickled pink but the in information officer for the island's chamber of commerce nevertheless claimed that the local opinion was split 50 50. island business owners were strongly in support but two years earlier sam dumaresk of deep bay which again is adjacent to snug cove had circulated an anti-park petition garnering 230 signatures and he now complained to a newspaper reporter that it was a lot of damn nonsense claiming that the people arriving from the city were drunk and disorderly and that they fornicate and everything else right out in plain view, Dumarest asked, why on earth would you want a 600 park for kooks from Vancouver to come and raise hell and smoke pot? <laughs> Aside from the concerns about increased ferry traffic and policing, the potential for forest fires uh, during the dry summers appears to be the, main chi being the chief reason for opposing camping, which they still do, and indeed the park itself. In order to gain local support, financial as well as moral, one of the GVRD Parks Committee's uh, first steps in 1983 was to enter into cooperative agreements with a number of Bowen recreational and conservationist groups. This was in keeping with the Lower Mainland Regional Parks Plan, drafted in 1966, with its focus on outdoor recreation, wildlife habitat, and cultural heritage programs in partnership with local citizens groups. As for the remaining cottages from the Union Steamship era, the department said that it would work with their occupants, because they rented out at this time, so that rentals could continue as long as possible. The plan was also to repair and maintain the old general store as a heritage site, 
but the budget remained very limited during the following three years. In fact, one of the reasons they were continued to rent the cottages out because it was a source of revenue. Um, finally, in 1986, the GVRD created the Bowen Island Special Committee to examine the growing problems it faced on the island. One of those problems was the challenge pre presented by Rondi Dyke's proposal for a $3 million marina village in Snug Cove that would triple the number of his births in the cove uh, to 300. The GVRD Parks Committee, uh, you can see the old marina over there on the far side, the left of the photo. Uh, the GVRD Parks Committee had applied to lease the same water for park purposes, claiming that its aspirations to restore beach activities and swimming were an important factor in its purchase of the former Union Steamship Company lands for a regional park. GVRD Parks Committee staff also noted that the steep slope created by dredging the cove would eliminate safe, attractive beach access from the picnic area and make it difficult for canoes and kayaks to gain access to the park shoreline. Furthermore, the oils, grease, sewage, and potent chemicals that would be produced by the marina would preclude swimming in the cove, and the dredging of the foreshore would eliminate all life within the intertidal flat. Finally, the large boats moored at the marina would obscure the distant view, thereby uh, changing the atmosphere of the lower Snug Cove picnic area. In short, one staff report concluded the Snug Cove waterfront is a vital recreational source, one that should be preserved and used by all the people of the Greater Vancouver region as part of Crippen Regional Park. Dyke, disagree, or Dyke argued in turn that his proposed development would not only improve the appearance of Snug Cove in the park, but also would provide employment for local residents. Furthermore, he claimed that the Snug Cove was not appropriate for a beach because of the ferry dock, existing marina, and heavily polluted foreshore. Finally, and most enticingly, Dyke noted that his marina would be eligible for provincial tourism and federal small craft harbor grants or low interest loans that could also be applied to services such as recreational facilities in the park and a sewage system for Snug Cove. The promise of a sewage system, fueled 50% by the province, 25% by the GVRD, and 25% by user groups, because at this point the sewers which is going right out into the mudflats there, was seen as a major benefit by those who supported Dyke's project. And he charged that those who opposed his marina were secretly concerned that resolving the sewage problem would result in mo mo more people moving to the island. According to Dyke's inflated rhetoric, they want to pull up the drawbridge. They want to halt all progress. Concerned citizens had, in fact, formed the 18 members Save the Park Committee to fight what they claimed would be the destruction of the park's entrance. In addition, the 240-member Bowen Island Improvement Association protested to the uh, Department of Lands, Parks and Housing that Dyke's proposal was in violation of 31 separate paragraphs in the island's OCP. Focusing on the environmental impact, the brief noted that the tidal flats offer highly productive habitats for a variety of ma marine organisms and are therefore extremely valuable as fish and bird habitat. Furthermore, the tidal flat at the head of Snug Cove was a potential educational reserve resource for the future res uh, of use of the region. Aside from dredging, a study of five marinas in Puget Sound showed that, um, that they had resulted in the accumulation of heavy metals from boat paints as well as petroleum products from fueling and bilges. And there was also the potential impact of the sewage outfall system that would be pr from pr Dyke's proposed laundromat, showers, washrooms, rental units, and so on. In addition, biologist Michael Dunn had, promoted, had submitted a brief to the GVRD pointing out that tidal flats and estuaries, which are 10 times more productive than a, type, a typical grassland, forest, or wheat field, constituted only 0.5% of the BC coastline and were equally rare in House Sound. Used to have fishing derbies in uh, Bowen every year. People would catch huge fish. That hasn't happened in many years. The GVRD's um, Bowen Island Special Committee, nevertheless, went a long way towards accommodating Dyke by declaring that the marine organization orientation of Crippen Park would be restricted to nearby Deep Bay. So once they said, we're not going to focus on this area for marine orientation, but the other side of the point there, Deep Bay, that kind of gave a green light for Dyke's development to go ahead. Uh, with the benefit of a $1 million federal subsidy, Dyke was given the green light to dredge up to eight acres of the cove, including the Crippen Park foreshore. Although the DF DFO did not do an environmental study, impact study, one of its biologists stated that the new gravel uh, uh, and sloping of the Snug Cove intertidal area 
would provide habitat compensation. No mention was made of the radically diminished expanse of the intertidal era, area or of the potential impact of increased pollution from boats, particularly given the fact that holding tanks were still not legally required on pleasure, on pleasure craft. Pointing to Dyke's promise to invest more than $2 million in his project, Bowen Island's pro-developer GVRD representative Gail Taylor claimed that the park was expected to uh, attract up to 200,000 people a year. I guess she was dreaming about the Union Steamship era. And the tourists would no longer be subjected to the awful smell of the mudflats at low tide. The aim of the marina development, according to Federal Minister of Tourism, was to make Snug Cove a destination resort for American boaters. But the result was that a tidal flat ecosystem and a view corridor from the park shoreline were sacrificed in order to provide a marine parking lot for yachts owned by affluent non-residents who bring limited economic benefits to the island. That's my opinion. Okay, uh, the other main controversial issue was the fate of the relatively few Union steamship cottages that remained in Snug Cove's uh, Davies Orchard. This is very recent history. The GVRD Parks Committee simply stated in 1987 that they had, these cottages had no particular heritage value, but many islanders disagreed. For example, local property developer Doug Berry complained that it was absurd to deny the heritage value of the remaining cottages, adding that if the Bowen Island of the future is to be anything more than a nicely forested dormitory to Vancouver, it must retain its individual character, of which its unique history is probably the most important aspect. Patrick Frey, Assistant Director of Historic Programs for the province's Ministry of Tourism, Recreation and Culture, also had reservations about the dismissal of the cottage's heritage value. He suggested to the senior planner for GVRD Parks that the remaining elements of the old Union Steamship Resort contributed positively to a unique cultural landscape at Snug Cove Deep Bay, and that the orchard cottages were clearly a component of this cultural landscape. Considered separately, Frey conceded, the cottages were simply modest, undistinguished resort structures, not unlike dozens of other beach cottages of similar or more recent vintage dotting the Gulf Islands, the Sunshine Coast, and the east coast of Vancouver Island. Collectively, however, there, um, they were the only surviving cluster of cabins that continued to visually convey their original function and historical association with the Union Steamship Resort. As arguably the most, important, the most prominent beach resort on the coast, Frey continued, the Union Steamship property was reflective of a particularly, particular phase in the growth of social forces influencing recreation and tourism activity in the province. Uh, GVRD nevertheless did a very little to keep the Davies, Orchard, Davies Cottages in repair, allowing them to deteriorate to the point where they needed major work to keep them standing. Uh, that's after they kicked out the tenants. Not willing to make that investment or to allow volunteers from the local trades community to play any role, Metro Parks, successor of course to GVRD, decided this past year to raise four of the remaining uh, ten cottages to knock them down, which they did this summer. And there originally had been 200, so they couldn't even save ten. And what it referred to as a revitalization process. This act of public vandalism was not surprising given the fact that Metro's regional parks plan for 2016 makes no mention whatsoever of heritage, which had once been a central plank in its, in a, its mandate. If you remember the early part of my talk, it was about uh, recreation, uh, environment, and heritage. Now heritage doesn't exist in their plan. <coughs> To summarize very briefly, the fact that Bowen Island is located so close to a major metropolis has meant that it has faced strong pressures for large-scale property development, but also that it has long been valued as a readily accessible site for Vancouverites to escape the city and enjoy the nature, nature for a day or so. So it's an interesting double-edged sword here. Vancouverites, because it's so close to a major metropolis, there's all kinds of development pressure, but because it's not developed, Vancouverites don't want it to be, so uh, you've got, it works both ways. It is not only because of the physical challenges to property developers then that Bowen still has only 3,700 res residents, but also because of political decisions made by local administrative authorities as well as external ones, in particular the GVRD, Islands Trust, and the provincial government. That said, had Stan James been a more practical-minded developer, had the economy not taken a sharp dip in the early 80s, uh, Glenn Crippen couldn't sell the land because it was the recession, so that's why he sold it at a, at a, you know, a, at a sacrifice to uh, GVRD. Crippen Park would not exist and Snug Cove would be a very diff different place than it is today. Few people on Bowen oppose further housing development, particularly in this current climate of young families being priced out of the local market. 
But the indifference of Metro Parks to local heritage, the renewed threat to the watershed posed by the province's logging company, if I can just take a second, when I, a few years after I moved there, there was a plebiscite for Bowen to become a national park, and uh, that was rejected by a fairly slim majority. Uh, and the people who opposed it becoming a park said, oh, don't worry, all that crown land uh, will never be logged. In perpetuity, it's safe. Well, last year the government announced that it could be logged. It's now, now in the logging uh, uh, vision. And the failure of governing authorities to prevent construction of the private mega docks, you see one of them here, that now scar the beautiful shoreline of Cape Roger Curtis, are three examples of recent or ongoing controversies that reflect Bowen's vulnerability to external forces that place the financial bottom line ahead of the natural as well as the cultural environment. It's therefore unfortunate that Vancouverites are not better informed about what has served as a precious resource for the city since the beginning of its history. Thank you.